So I've already brought you to Admiral Nimitz's office, which used to be my office decades after it was his office. Brought you to all over Pearl Harbor, and now we're in the Nimitz house in Yerba Linda Island, near Treasure Island. Um, Admiral Nimitz, after he retired, he never really retired, he was a five-star admiral, which meant he stayed on the active duty roster throughout his life until he died. Um, settled, not retired, in the San Francisco Bay area. It was the Kensington area above Berkeley, because he was a regent at Berkeley University, he's very happy about that, because that's where he established the ROTC unit earlier in his life, and he loved the Bay Area. He wasn't going to go back to Texas um, for whatever reason. So he spent his last years here. Um, he loved that house in Kensington at, at above the University of California at Berkeley. But when his health began to fail, the Navy said, look, in order to take care of you, we need to move you closer to the Navy clinic. So they convinced him to move here to this house and we'll show you a video of the house itself. And, um, and this is basically where he lived out the remaining years of his life until he died. He died in this house. There's some controversy about which room he died in. The bedroom was upstairs, uh, but it, it, it's his daughter, who was a, a Dominican nun, of all things, uh, says that the, he didn't die in the bedroom, that after he became um, unable to really move around and ambulatory, despite the fact there was a, they put an elevator in the house, he had to stand up to use the elevator. Uh, they moved a bed down here into this library, which is where we are now. And this is the room that he's reported to have died in, although I can't understand why there's this dispute. But in my imagining, you've got the Admiral surrounded by his books, putting a big wall of Pacific over there with a bed facing this wall with a big map of the Pacific. That's the way I imagine it anyway. And um, it's kind of remarkable to be in this house. You know, he touched these things, he, he lived it here. Uh, it's, and, and the fact that after the Navy moved out of Treasure Island and shut down our operations here, the city of San Francisco took it, and as governments often do, fairly ignored it, and the house is extremely run down. It's, it's tragic, because this should be a national landmark, and it's so sad that the house is in such poor condition. Um, no running water, uh, no working plumbing, and all of that. So I call upon the city of San Francisco to do the right thing, uh, for what they, someone they claim to be their favorite son, Admiral Nimitz. So I'm with uh, the grandchildren of Admiral Spruins, and so David Bogart and Ellen Spruins Holscher. You know, here we are at the Golden Gate National Cemetery, and you know it's kind of remarkable that. Admiral Nimitz says he was failing, uh, you know, he didn't use his authority to, to declare or demand that an exception be made. He actually wrote a letter and said, you know, I realize that this is against policy, but if, if I could ex uh, request an exception to the policy, I'd like to be buried alongside your grandfather, Admiral Spruins. Um, Admiral Charles Lockwood, who commanded the submarine force during the Pacific War, and um, Richmond Kelly Turner was the fourth one. And so we have varying opinions of Admiral Turner, but we have, we're all aligned on the supremacy of, of your grandfather's command of his, the Fifth Fleet when he was operating. So, I mean, you both knew your grandfather, obviously, and I'll start with you, David. What, what kind of memories do you have of him? Um, I, I didn't spend a lot of time with him, but the, mm. the memories I have, uh, visiting him in his home that mm. we now live in, um, on our way uh, to and from Japan in mm. the mid-50s, uh, 60s, 50s. Mm. And um, he, was, uh, he, he was kind. He was... Um, you know, he, he wasn't very gregarious with us. Mm -hmm. He was reserved, but um, Ellen has had a lot more yeah, experience you, with her. She's 
Yeah. So he also visited us when my dad was stationed at Quonset Point and had mm -hmm. orders there. Your dad was on active duty, so you were a Navy. Yeah, uh, we, we moved all over, so yeah. we, we would, right. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, he did come out uh, in the, when we were stationed, this would have been in uh, 62, 63, mm -hmm. stationed at Quonset Point. He and my grandmother would come out in mm -hmm. the fall to uh, visit us and then go look at the foliage, mm -hmm. New England foliage. Always and uh, we, the quarters we, we were in at that time had one bathroom. Mm -hmm. We were three children. Um, and so, and they stayed with us. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a bit of a challenge to share that bathroom with, mm -hmm. with so many people. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, I think Ellen probably can yeah. speak more to the personal side mm -hmm. of our grandfather. Yes, you knew him as a kind man. Uh, but but you didn't have a lot of experience. No, yeah, I do remember plant. he used to say, look at me and say, can you wiggle your ears? <laughs> and um, I, and he, then his ears would start to move. Seriously. He actually really? could do that. He could do it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine the Fifth Fleet commander entertaining his grandchildren by wiggling his ears. But what a great story. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And uh, Ellen, you did obviously know much, you were with him much more. Well, we had, um, my brother and I had two complete summers with our grandparents. Mm -hmm. And that allowed my father to change duty stations and set up their new, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. or uh, Coronado. Mm -hmm. And so we would spend the summer, and when we were the, the younger when we were younger, on the youngest time we were there, mm. um, we just played mm. every day. And, and he would play with you? Well, no, we would go for a walk. Oh, he, had to, he, he would get up at 5.30 in the morning. He got up at 5.30 in the morning every morning. He took a cold shower, and he had a very elaborate um, coffee ritual with very elaborate equipment. Coffee from Kona that a friend sent to him from... Mm -hmm from Kona Coffee, and he would start that, and then he, he would... roast his own beans. Yes, he, that right? roasted, he would roast them, he'd be, he'd roast them, and he has this thing, and he'd be outside in the backyard swinging this thing in the, in a, to cool it off after the beans were roasted. Were roasted. And uh, he would take a walk by himself early in the morning, and then come back with the newspaper, and then my grandmother had one huge, large coffee cup mm -hmm. with coffee and so finally when I got to be about 16 I was allowed to have the coffee because it was the best in the world yeah and then we had we'd always have another walk or two every day mm -hmm. and um yeah. and he worked in the garden mm -hmm. every day laid the brick patio and the brick walkway himself with Mr. Shoemaker, and he right? worked with a wonderful <laughs> Mr. Shoemaker, the gardener, mm -hmm. who worked, and they they gardened, and he had compost bins. He composted, mm -hmm. and um, he had certain things he would have at each meal. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the lunch? Triscuits, peanut butter, <laughs> cottage cheese, fruit, and a glass of buttermilk. Mm -hmm. Now that if he wouldn't do that if he were at the old um, at the Capital City Club in Monterey, old, old Capital, old Club. Capital yeah. Club, he mm -hmm. would have whatever they had. But mm -hmm. yes, well, he and Avril Nimitz, when they were you know living together, actually in the house in Makalapa, when he was Admiral Nimitz's chief of staff, um, had a very elaborate walking ritual as well, where they would walk for miles and miles and miles, and or they would go swimming in Hawaii, in the open ocean, and just swim for miles. And in cold water, I've done that. It's 72 degrees, it's not warm. Yeah, get your swimming pool down to 72 degrees and try swimming at it. But they would do this. And I they think were, that was Nimitz that got him into swimming, wasn't it? Yeah, it, 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 I think everybody in the academy has to swim. So, it, But I think you're right, from that standpoint, it was Nimitz that got him into it. And they were so, they were kindred spirits, I think. I think that's one of the reasons Nimitz wanted him so badly to stay at, my, at Sink, Peak, Sink Pack Fleet headquarters, but he realized that he needed him out in the fleet as a fleet commander. Did he ever talk about the war to you two? Not to me. 
really? that I recall. No, no, not really. No. Not really. Uh, but we had many over the years, They, when we were there in the summers, they had parties a lot. And they would go to parties. And, of course, there was a lot in the background of talking about the Navy and remembering mm -hmm. because they were ma mainly military friends. So I don't know whether I received any of that by osmosis or not, but... Um, Probably they were remembering friends, but I don't remember any serious discussions, you know, about the battles. Yeah, yeah right. Very and then, right. Shoot or anything like that. Right. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. It's so good. So any, but how would you characterize Admiral Spruance as a man? I mean, if you were to summarize it in a short statement. Oh, my goodness. Well, he was very, very kind. He was quiet. He was, he had a wonderful laugh that really wasn't, it was not a huge laugh, but it was a, it was his, he would all sort of shake from top to bottom when, in a, with a very controlled um, sense of joy. So uh, he was inquisitive. Uh, he played classical music every night or Harry Belafonte. And he sat in the, rocking chair that was given to him when he was seven years old and my grandmother would, was dying to get it moved out and have her pretty furniture be more more prominent but he insisted that until the day he died that chair was where he sat in the little rocking chair that he received when he was seven mm -hmm. so um, he did have a twinkle in his eye when mm -hmm. he was amused mm -hmm. um and and a good sense of humor, yeah. subtle but good. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. I, and again, if if I sound like I'm, he's one of my idols. It's because he is. I mean, from the naval perspective, but as a man as well. And this is why I admire both him and Admiral Nimitz so much. Because not only, in my opinion, were they number one and number two best admirals in the history of the United States Navy but also they were good men, good human beings. Um, not pretentious and no ego. There, there was no guile, right? It was, they were what they were, right? And, and, um, and great role models for not just naval officers, but all military officers. And we need more spruances. We talked previously about the fact that Admiral Nimitz wanted to be buried alongside those he felt closest to during the war. Uh, he was a five-star admiral. He could have demanded, used his rank, gone to the Secretary of Defense, done all kinds of things to get permission to be buried here. The Army rules, Army generally runs military, or Veterans Administration generally run uh, these cemeteries. The rules do not allow somebody to, to request a specific burial spot. What Admiral Nimitz did was he wrote a very humble letter saying, I know that this is against policy, but I'd like to know if I could ask for an exception to that policy because I'd like to be buried alongside Raymond Spruance, the commander of Fifth Fleet, Charles Lockwood, who we've talked about so much, the commander of the Pacific Fleet Submarine Force, and somebody we talk about occasionally, Richmond Kelly Turner. Now, we've said good things about Admiral Turner and not so good things about Admiral Turner, but Admiral Nimitz liked him enough that he wanted to be part of this group in death. And here, the, here it is, just the way he requested. Okay, and the wives are alongside as well. Admiral Turner's wife, Admiral Lockwood's wife, Admiral Spruance's wife, Margaret, Margaret, and of course, Admiral Nimitz's wife, Catherine. And how can I not say something about Admiral Lockwood? We, we talked so much about the impact that Admiral Lockwood's submarine force had on the conduct of the war, starving Japan and shortening the war by diminishing Japan's ability to fight. This man commanded the greatest submarine force 
Um, at that time in the history of the world, I'd like to think that the submarine force continued to get stronger after the war ended, but we're never going to have as many submarines as Admiral Lockwood commanded, nor hopefully will we require of the submarine force the kind of effort that we needed from them during World War II because hopefully a war like that will never happen again.